When the verdict came down last year, human rights advocates were happy. The Australian government was not. A court in Papua New Guinea ordered the closure of a refugee detention centre on Manus Island, a notorious offshore facility set up by the government in Canberra to keep asylum seekers from reaching Australian shores. Eighteen months later, the authorities have shut down the camp. They've turned out the lights. But the refugees refuse to leave, saying the new facility they've been offered is unsafe and that they fear coming under attack by locals. Here at The Listening Post, we've looked at the coverage, the lack of it, of two offshore prisons established by the Australian government, one on Manus, the other on the island nation of Nauru. Journalists trying to report on conditions at the prisons have been shut out, bounced around endlessly by the governments involved. The story has moved on, but the pattern of locking reporters out has not. The Listening Post's Johanna Hoos now on the stories coming out of Manus Island and Nauru, despite the best efforts of the authorities involved. I think the Australian government has tried very hard to shape the narrative. And we're paying for you to go to the new house, we're going to provide you with meals. About what is happening on Manus and Nauru, and it's done so very effectively, because it's so hard for journalists to be able to go there and to tell the stories of what is happening. What have we done wrong? You are not allowed to go and take photos there. Putting these detention centres offshore really was about putting them out of sight and out of mind of the Australian public. And this just shows how effective that strategy has been. This stuff is also not working. There is no water here. The United Nations has called what is happening on Manus Island a humanitarian emergency. Since the Australian government closed the Manus detention camp on October 31st, over 400 men are refusing to leave. They have gone nearly three weeks without water, food, electricity and medical supplies. They claim that the facilities they are being forced to move to lack adequate security to protect them from attacks by the local community. Yet, this hasn't become the media spectacle one might expect. Only two reporters have been there to cover the story. Media access to Manas and Nauru has been tightly controlled since the camps reopened in 2012, and the Australian government is playing a blame game with the PNG and Nauruan authorities as to who is responsible. But journalists say they have no doubt Australia is pulling the strings. Photojournalist Matthew Abbott tried to go to Manus Island last week, but was refused entry. A year earlier, he published a story on Manus locals brutally attacking two refugees, not the kind of story the Australian government wants out there. I was told that there's a very little chance that I'd be allowed back in a second time um, after my work there. But you know, I tried anyway because it's a very important story. I just waited like any other person, you know, entering Papua New Guinea in the visa on arrival line. And upon reaching the immigration desk, talking to the officer, I just passed her my passport and she said, oh, hey, um, are you involved with like publishing disruptive material from, from Manus Island? And that's when I knew that there was no way I was getting you know, into Papua New Guinea. There are real reasons to believe that there is a blacklist for Australian journalists. Australia certainly has a long history of stifling reporting on immigration detention centres. There are some reporters on the ground who are doing a great job but there's just not enough voices and not enough reporters there bearing witness to what's happening in this critical time. This is and showers in Journalists Boston. have come to rely on reports from refugees and whistleblowers to find out what is going on inside. For years, phones have been refugees' lifelines, the only way to inform the world about their plight. They have shared stories of physical abuse, lack of medical facilities, mental stress, and in one case, even murder at the hands of the security guards. We spoke to Eruz Buchani via audio messages on WhatsApp. He's one of the refugees still inside the Manus camp. For the past five years, independent journalists couldn't have access to this place. They always prevent the independent media and those media who are doing their stories in a fair way to come to Manus Island. But the uh, important thing is that they never can prevent sending the information and documents out. One of the remarkable developments in the last few years has been the way that technology has given a voice to the men on Manus Island. We've seen 
asylum seekers on Twitter. We've seen Telegram groups. We've seen WhatsApp groups being set up. And all of these provide a way for unfiltered, unmoderated accounts of what's happening there on the ground. But the real challenge is still how Australian reporters can verify and gain access to that information firsthand. We also spoke to Amir Taginia, one of the few who made it out of Manus. Just a few weeks ago, private sponsors paid for his transfer to Canada. During his four years in the prison, he set up Manus Alert, a public channel on the cloud-based app Telegram to which he and his fellow refugees upload footage and their stories. It quickly became one of journalists' main sources of information. If I didn't uh, smuggle that phone inside the center and I couldn't get internet on that small old smartphone, I wouldn't be in here. I did everything with that small phone. So I said, all right, let's create a channel on Telegram and I would call it Manus Alert. I would keep sending pictures and videos and statements and letters. I think right now around 600 people are on that channel and majority of them are Australians and journalists. Yet, despite sources such as Manus Alert, journalists are increasingly staring away from this story. Not least, because Australian audiences have grown increasingly apathetic. Reporting on Manus and Nauru no longer gets the clicks, the likes, that too often drives the media's agenda. I think it's appalling that there is so little coverage of what's happening on Manus and Nauru, particularly if you look at the big commercial networks in Australia. And I think amongst the Australian people, there's now a lot of fatigue about these issues. That's also there because they don't really know and they don't really understand. Uh, what is happening. I think Australians would be horrified to know what is happening on Manus and Nauru. But the reality is they don't have those images to see it in front of their face. Typically, the images Australians are seeing are like these, distant and limited. Taken from afar, they lack the faces and personal stories that tend to affect audiences. They fail to capture, up close, what's happening. A current affair has been granted unprecedented access. And the few outlets the authorities in Canberra have allowed into the camp, the Australian newspaper and Sky, both owned by Rupert Murdoch's News Corp and Channel 9, are known for sticking to the government's line. You've got some air conditioning at least. Yes. And the TV, they gave you TV. I think privileged access is given to certain media and certain outlets that portray Australian policies in a certain light. We've been told the situation could get volatile, so we've been asked to stay in our car. For the, the reporting that they've done has been very superficial. It's barely scratched the surface. It's focused a lot on things like the physical facilities that the refugees and asylum seekers are living in, the physical standard of the accommodation, and saying that, well, you know, they're living in nice houses, this is all being paid for by the Australian government, so therefore, you know, isn't life all good on Nauru. There's also a playground, a gym and a food hall that provides three meals a day. The Australian government was putting everything on table to stop the media from coming to Manus Island. But News Corp was one of the media that got on the island and tried to represent people in an untrue way. They tried whatever they could, however they could, to demonize refugees. They were allowed into places where no other media was allowed. How can this happen? Because that's what the Australian authorities want. Aided by news organizations that either tow the government's line or have simply given up trying to get access, the Manus and Aru camps operate mostly in the dark. It's as though the only way out for the story and for the lucky few is through a smartphone. The rest of the refugees remain out of sight, out of mind, and a long way from the headlines.